Turn with me to Proverbs 11 and verse 2. We're just going to cover one tonight because I think there'd be too much for two. Um, Proverbs 11, 2 says, When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Let's start by defining our terms. Pride is the quality of being proud, a high or overweening opinion of one's own qualities, attainments, or estate, which gives rise to a feeling of a feeling and attitude of superiority over and contempt for others, inordinate self esteem. And then shame is the painful emotion arising from the consciousness of something dishonoring, ridiculous, or indecorous in one's own conduct or circumstances, or in those of others whose honor or disgrace one regards as one's own. So like if your spouse or your children or your parents or somebody, you know, did something horrible, then you'd feel that same feeling of dishonor and ridicule even though you yourself didn't do it. You'd feel ashamed because of what somebody close to you did. Or of being in a situation which offends one's sense of modesty or decency. Like if you like you ever have a dream where you're walking around in your underwear or less and you feel ashamed, right? That's that's Terrible. what that's yes, that's what that's talking about. Uh, there's a lot of uh, people that don't have that anymore, though. They walk around you know, basically in their underwear in public in the summertime anyway, and they don't think a thing of it. They refuse to be ashamed, as the Bible says. So, in other words, if we put the definitions in, when it says, When pride cometh and cometh shame, when a man adopts a high opinion of himself, his, his attainments and, or his estate, and feels superior to others, he will experience the pain of being dishonored, ridiculed, and disgraced. Because men in general, no matter reprobate or godly, most people don't like pride in somebody else anyway. So when they see a man that's proud and thinks highly of himself, and boasts about himself, that they're going to be having ridicule for him, at least in their mind, um, and then oftentimes... Um, you know, come out also in their attitudes and their speech, and this person that acts like that will end up being dishonored and disgraced, is what this verse is teaching. Uh, we're told in Psalm 119 and verse 78 that the proud will be ashamed. <clears throat> and I think uh, probably a great example of this is our former president, right? A mm. proud man who was ashamed or should have been anyway because there he, he he lost an election to a guy that's demented and has alzheimer's and doesn't even know where he is and i mean the the least popular president in american history the former president lost the election to this guy and so it's like yeah talk about being ashamed uh, your pride brings you low uh, Psalm 119 and verse 78 says, Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause, but I will meditate in thy precepts. So this is uh, what you call an imprecatory prayer, which means you're praying a, like a curse, essentially, on somebody else. Let the proud be ashamed. So he's praying that they will be ashamed, that God will bring them to shame because they dealt perversely with him without a cause. And then I just noticed this too. What happens if people d deal perversely with you without a cause? Like you get unjustly attacked. What should you do? Should you go out there and defend yourself and, and try to right that wrong? Well, here's what this psalmist did. But I will meditate in thy precepts. He says, I've been, I've been maligned without cause here. I've been treated very badly. And I'm going to give it to God. I'm going to ask God to make these people ashamed. And I'm going to meditate in his word. I'm going to let God take care of it. And that's a good idea. We should all adopt that attitude. <clears throat> There's a time to fight, but not every time. Sometimes it's best just to let the Lord fight your battles for you. I think he would not have been able to please them anyway. No. If he had done whatever... No, definitely not. So, one characteristic of proud men is that they will not receive instruction, and therefore they will be brought to shame. 
And, there, and as I was thinking about this, as I was reviewing it today, I thought of actually two different reasons for this. Uh, Proverbs 13 and verse 18. Proverbs 13, 18. It says, Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. So shame and honor are opposites, right? Um, shame is that feeling of uh, dishonoring, right? Um, so the way to honor is regarding reproof and accepting correction from people. And the way to shame and poverty is by refusing instruction. And I got thinking about this. So there's two different ways in which somebody that refuses instruction can have shame. The first reason is just by simply refusing instruction. Like if somebody gives you good instruction, they tell you, hey, this is what you should do, or this is what you should not do, and you're like, oh, well, I don't need anybody telling me what to do. Well, right there, you should be ashamed, right? Just, just surely by re rejecting instruction, that's a shameful thing. But then secondly, and this is, I think, what this proverb is really getting at, is that when you don't receive the instruction and then you do the thing that the person instructed you against, and then it turns out badly and whatever, you get into poverty or whatever, whatever the thing is, then you also have that shame of not only didn't you listen, but now you're in a bad situation, right? So now you're feeling shame doubly, uh, which I hadn't really thought about that uh, prior to this. <clears throat> so basically, this verse is getting at that it's dishonoring to experience failure or injury or poverty due to being too proud to accept instruction or correction from others. And there's been many a prodigal son out there that didn't heed the instruction of his father or whoever and ended up doing things his own way, like the prodigal, right? He, I, I, it doesn't say that the father instructed him not to go out and waste his living uh, with riotous living, but I just have a sneaking suspicion when his father divided him the portion of his goods, he probably said before he embarked on this journey to go off and blow it all, now son, don't go out there and blow all this money. Don't waste it all. You better save it. This is all you're getting, right? You better not go out there and live riotously with harlots and, and party it up. He didn't listen, and he came to poverty and shame, so much shame that he was eating with the pigs, right? Mm -hmm. And he was so hungry that he came to himself and said, I could go back to my father's house and be a servant. It'd be a lot better than eating with these swine. So that he was brought to shame for not hearkening to instruction. And we're told in Proverbs 29 and verse 23 that a man's pride will bring him low. Proverbs 29 and verse 23. It says, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. You know, I think about um, Uzziah, King Uzziah, and he was going to make an offering, an incense offering, in the temple. And the priests resisted him, and they said, It appertaineth not unto the Uzziah. And because of his pride, he wasn't going to receive instruction. He was going to make that offering. I'm the king, after all. Who's going to tell me? Right? God, God would certainly be pleased with the king making an offering of incense. Mm -hmm. And he went and pressed forward with that, mm -hmm. and he was brought to shame. That leprosy came right up in his face, mm -hmm. right there at that very time. So man's pride shall bring him low. God has a way of humbling those who won't humble themselves. And those who think highly of themselves will be brought to shame in social settings. And the Bible gives us an example of this in Luke 14, 8 through 9. Luke 14, 8 through 9. You want to remember this, anytime you go to a wedding or any kind of an event, when you choose your seat, pick a seat in the back. Don't pick a seat right up front. You know, if you, if you go to a wedding and you sit in the first pew of the church building, and, and that pew is, the, the first couple of them are nicely decorated on the, right on the railings, and you wonder why nobody else is sitting there, and you think, well, I'll just sit here. Well, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to be asked to move back. Because that's for the parents or whoever. Uh, but this is what Jesus is teaching us here. 
pick your seat carefully. If you're smart and you're wise, you'll pick a seat back further and then maybe, just maybe, you might get asked to move up. You pick one up front, you may be asked to move back. Luke 14, 8 through 9, says, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. You can imagine that would be very dishonoring. You get up, and I mean, by that point, everybody sat down, and, and all of a sudden they walk up, tap you on the shoulder, and say, Hey, you got to get up and walk in front of everybody and go to the back or go somewhere else. Would not be fun. Or another situation I, I thought about. I don't know that I've seen this happen, but I can imagine it happening. You can imagine like you're at, a, at a, some kind of a company meeting and the boss is um, up there and he's, he's giving a bit of a speech. And he said, you know, I, I would really like to recognize one of my employees. They've just done a fabulous job, worked super hard. And, of course, the proud guy is sitting there thinking, oh, he's, he's talking about me. Yeah, absolutely. He's, definitely. he's like, so I would like to ask him to stand up now. And you, he starts to stand up and then he calls out another guy. And how embarrassed would you be thinking that he was talking about you when he wasn't? He just right. went to the restroom. <laughs> right, yeah. If you, were, if you were clever, you would have just turned, yes. That, Mordecai. Yeah. Uh, not Mordecai, Haman. Haman, yes, yeah. oh, exactly. Oh, yeah, well. who, who else could the king want to honor? Obviously. Yeah. So, yeah, be, be careful. But, you know, catch yourself. Because uh, it's easy if somebody starts talking about somebody doing some great thing and you automatically think, oh, they're talking about me. <laughs> they might not be talking about you. Uh, Those who exalt themselves shall be abased. Um, Luke 14, 11, uh, just the first part there. This is continuing on this same uh, parable here that Jesus gave. He says, for whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. And we'll get to the second half of that. A little bit later here. But if you exalt yourself, you'll be a base, which means to be brought low. God will do that. Men will do that to you. Um, God has a way of, of taking care of that. It's kind of like the pieces of grass that grow up quickly. They higher than the rest, and the, grass, the lawnmower comes and chops them off. Right? That's what happens to the guy that sticks up his head thinking that he's, <laughs> he's so uh, worthy of honor. Now, honor, on the other hand, is the opposite of shame, and it comes through humility, which is the opposite of pride. Let's look at Proverbs 15 and verse 33. Proverbs 15:33 It says, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. So, in other words, if you want to make it to a position of honor, the path to that is being humble, having a low opinion of oneself. It's kind of counterintuitive. You know, we, we as men, as people, think that the way to get honored is to promote myself and make sure everybody knows what a great job I've done or how smart I am or how talented I am, uh, but it, it works just the opposite. The, the path to honor is through humility. You just got to be patient, and if your work is truly meritorious, somebody will notice, and somebody will honor you for it. Proverbs 18 and verse 12. And you know what? If nobody ever honors you for it in this life, God sees it all. And, and if you've done it for Him, like we're supposed to, then you'll get your reward someday. Uh, Proverbs 18 and verse 12 it says, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, which is a synonym of pride or proud. And before honor is humility. So destruction, the path to destruction is through haughtiness, through having a high opinion of yourself. The path to honor is through having a low opinion of yourself. And those who humble themselves will be exalted and lifted up by God. Let's look at the second half of that, that uh, Luke 14:11 Luke 14 verse 11 
this is one of the doctrine. This is one point of doctrine or teaching, uh, principle of life, where the Bible and the world are 180 degrees opposite. Right? In some things, the world kind of you know goes along with the Bible because it just makes good sense. It makes sense to their their rational minds or something. Uh, but there's some things that that are contrary. And the world teaches that you have to have a high self-esteem, right? You've heard of this whole self-esteem right. garbage. Um, and that's the problem with children these days. They don't have a high self-esteem. They don't, they don't think highly enough of themselves. And if we can just teach them to, te- to, to think highly of themselves and, and to be really co- you know, confident and full of themselves, um, then they'll do well. But if we teach them to be humble and to have a low estimation of themselves, then they're just going to be depressed and they're never going to make it anywhere and so on. That's, that's what the psychologists tell us. Mm-hmm. Here's what Jesus said. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. See, the thing is with the, the quote, low self-esteem, really that's just another form of pride mm-hmm. because low self-esteem is not low self-esteem, right? Because self-esteem is what you think of yourself, Mm -hmm. right? So low self-esteem, quote-unquote, by definition would be thinking lowly of yourself, right? Low self-esteem basically would be humility if you want to just take the words for what they actually mean, right? Mm -hmm. But low self-esteem, in quotes, as the psychologists talk about it, what that really is is a form of pride because the child or the person that has the low self-esteem and therefore wears the weird clothing and wears a mohawk and colors his hair and whatever else because he's got a low self-esteem, what he really has is a high self-esteem and he thinks he he deserves attention that he's not getting. He's focused on himself. He thinks that in order to get the attention that is due unto him that he really deserves, he has to do something like the weird hair the weird clothing, the weird behavior, and then that will draw attention, other people's attention to him. So really what it is, is it's an inordinate self-esteem. It is thinking that he deserves more recognition and respect than he's getting. And if he can't get it through something meritorious, then he'll get it through poor behavior. So basically, low self-esteem is really just a form of pride. It's just a, it's on the opposite spectrum of it. Um, do you think that sometimes they just don't differentiate they, what they really, do you think sometimes they have confusion between low self-esteem, as they're calling it, and lack of self-confidence? Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that, you know? that can be. Um, because we do want our children to be confident, um, you know, mm-hmm. and maybe I don't know exactly all the difference, but sometimes I think that's that should be the goal for it. We want to feel confident that we can do this job that we're going after or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and but that's a different story. To, to be confident that you can do a job that you are qualified to do, that you have the skills to do, is not a high and overweening opinion of yourself. Mm-hmm. That's just a legitimate, that's just a, a, a correct valuation of yourself that, I know I can do this, and therefore I'm not going to be afraid, and I'm going to step out and do it because I can do it, right? That that that's not a, a over you know a, a, a proud. That's that's not being proud. Um, so yeah, I there would be a difference between a child that has really low confidence and a quote low self esteem, as the psychologists talk about it, at least in, as I see it anyway. Um, it would be good to teach a child to to have confidence that he can do things that he can actually do. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I think that would be that would be a wise thing to teach children. Mm-hmm. But I think uh, along those lines, on the other thing, uh, other aspect of it, I think it's dumb to tell a child that you can do anything you put your mind to, because <laughs> you really can't, right? Yeah. I mean, you tell a little kid that's you know four and a half feet tall and is destined to be five foot three when he grows up that he can be anything he wants, including a professional basketball player or whatever. That's just ridiculous. Unless you're Muggsy Bogues and there's like one of them out of, you know, a billion. So, um, or, you know, 
poor kid that has an average IQ of 100 and he, he wants to be a, you know, a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon or something. You know, you know, it would be better to point him in a direction to something that he has the aptitude for and that he would do well at, right? But, but it, that doesn't make as good of uh, high school valedictorian speeches as uh, you can be whatever you want to be, you can do whatever you want to do, you just take life by the horns and, yeah, to get up there and say, well, you can do a, a handful of things and you can probably do them pretty well, so find those, find those things that you're okay at. And that doesn't make for a good graduation speech. And don't so. go to college because it's too expensive. <laughs> right, and... yes, and a waste of time in a public cesspool and it'll destroy your faith and ruin your morals and, yeah. All right, anyway, uh, back to Luke 18, 13 through 14. Luke 18, 13 through 14. Jesus said, And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Remember what the other one said? He stood up there and prayed with himself, and he thanks God. He's not like other men, extortioners and just adulterers, and even like this publican, I fast twice in a week, I give tithes of all that I possess, right? And then the publican stands up and mm -hmm. says, God have mercy, uh, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now, it doesn't say what happened to this Pharisee that stood there and prayed thus with himself, but I'm guessing that he probably got busted down a notch eventually. Um, who knows what happened to him, but I'll bet you his life didn't quite turn out like he had hoped it would. He was probably abased. And I have a feeling, though it doesn't say what happened to this publican either, but I have a feeling that this publican went places but the Lord lifted him up just like the Bible says that he would God loves a humble person he lifts up and helps uh, such succeed look at uh, James 4 and verse 10 James 4 and verse 10 says humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up good to humble yourself in the sight of men too but humble yourself in the sight of the Lord even when men aren't looking mm -hmm. don't just try to look humble to others but actually be humble right because God he sees the heart he sees you all the time so be humble mm -hmm. and God will lift you up mm -hmm. and one more verse a couple of more verses on this where it says when pride cometh then cometh shame well if you humble yourself and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not be ashamed, uh, no matter what. I mean, you might, you might worry that you'll be ashamed because if I, maybe if I take this stand and people are going to laugh at me and they're going to think I'm weird or if I tell them I don't celebrate Christmas and they're going to wonder what's wrong with me or, or I won't wear the clothes that the other girls do at school and they're going to make fun of me or something. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you do what he says, you're not going to be ashamed. Mm -hmm. Psalm 25 and verse 20 says, O oh, keep my soul and deliver me, let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. That's a good prayer. Good prayer to pray. Let me not be ashamed, because I put my trust in thee. And then if you turn over to Romans 10, in verse 11, Romans 10, 11, that you'll recognize this verse. I'm sure you've read it a number of times. Romans 10, 11. It says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him, that is on the Lord Jesus Christ, shall not be ashamed. So you believe on him, and you trust in Christ, and you won't be ashamed. You won't be brought to poverty because of positions and um, principles that you've stuck with. You won't be um, made to look like a fool when 
your religion is shown to be a, a sham, because it won't be, because the Christian religion, the Bible, is not a sham. It's not cunningly devised fables. You can trust anything this book says, and it will always end up being true. It doesn't matter if you people want to make fun of you in school because you believe in a six-day creation. They're going to be the ones that are going to be ashamed someday. You trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he says in his word. You will never be ashamed. Now we get to get to the good part of the proverb, although I was kind of talking about some good stuff already. But we'll get to the good part of the proverb now in the second half, which says, But with the lowly is wisdom. So when pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Lowly is humble in feeling or demeanor, not proud or ambitious. Humble is having a low estimate of one's importance, worthiness, or merits, marked by the absence of self-assertion or self-exaltation, lowly, the opposite of proud. And there's a, there's a fine line there between being confident, as you were mentioning a minute ago, and being self-assertive, like trying to put yourself out there and force yourself and, and, and say, no, really, I can do this, right? And, and Talk about your glory. Yes, and promoting yourself. I mean, there, there is definitely a fine line between those things. Wisdom is capacity of judging rightly in matters relating to life and conduct, soundness of judgment in the choice of means and ends, sometimes less strictly sound sense, especially in practical affairs, opposed to folly. So if we put the definitions into the into this second half of the verse, but with the lowly is wisdom, we see, in other words, that those who have a low estimate of their own importance, worthiness, or merits, and do not assert or exalt themselves, will have sound judgment and will make good decisions. So the path to wisdom is humility. With the lowly is wisdom. So if you want to have wisdom, it is by having a low opinion of yourself. Now, people that have wisdom have a low opinion of themselves. People that think they have wisdom have a high opinion of themselves. Right? So there's a difference between people that have wisdom and people that think they have wisdom. Now, the contrasting conjunction here that this verse starts out with, or this phrase starts out with, but, right, but with the lowly is wisdom. This contrasted conjunction reveals that the proud do not have wisdom, right? Because it says there, when pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. So the proud don't have wisdom. Now, of course, they think that they have wisdom because they think highly of themselves. I mean, you show me a proud person that doesn't think he has wisdom, right? I mean, every proud person thinks he has wisdom, how could you be a proud person and not think you have wisdom, right? Of course, every proud person thinks he has it, um, but this verse says that he doesn't have it. So who's right? The proud fool or God's word? God's word, of course, is right. These types, proud people, are wise in their own eyes and thoughts. Uh, Proverbs 26 and verse 12. Proverbs 26 and verse 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit, right? His own conceit, his own thought, his own ideas. There's more hope of a fool than of him. So the guy that thinks he's wise in his own mind, there's more hope of a fool. Now, you know what the Bible says about a fool. I mean, we've talked about that a lot over the last few years in this study. Uh, the Bible has nothing good to say about a fool, but yet... A fool's got more hope than the man that thinks that he's wise in his own mind. He thinks he's really smart. He thinks he's got a lot of wisdom. Uh, Isaiah 5 and verse 21. God pronounces a woe upon such. Isaiah 5 and verse 21. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Now, if you're wise in other people's eyes, you are blessed. If you're wise in your own eyes, you have a woe pronounced upon you. See, in some cases, it doesn't matter what other people think, but in some cases, it does. If other people think you're wise, if other godly people think you're wise, then that's a really good thing. Um, 
whatever you think about yourself doesn't really matter in that case. It's what other people think is important in that case, anyway. In some cases, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks of you. But in, when it comes to that kind of thing, it does. Those who think they are wise and tell others so are in truth proud fools. They know nothing, despite their high opinion of their supposed wisdom. And I got a verse for you. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 4. You can find lots of wise people if you just go out there and ask people if they're wise. Because um, uh, what's the what's the how's the proverb go that um, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Right. So you can just start doing a poll, and you'll find all kinds of wise people. <laughs> so so they say anyway. First uh, Timothy six and verse four. Because after all, if you did a poll and you say, "Do you think you're a wise person?" How many people are going to say, no, I'm not really, no, I'm just pretty stupid. I make like really bad decisions typically. I mean, you know, most people are probably not going to say that even if it's true. But, um, How would you um, answer that question if someone does ask you? Uh, do you think you're a wise person? I would just say that the Lord's, the Lord's opinion is the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. so. uh, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 4. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, and so on. But all I really wanted was just that first part. He is proud, knowing nothing. Now, the thing is, most people that are proud, they think they know everything, but the Bible says he's proud and knows nothing. Isn't that interesting how God has a different opinion of men than they do of themselves, than we do of ourselves, I should say. Now, a man will not be truly wise until he humbles himself and doesn't think that he's wise. It seems counterintuitive, but you're never going to be wise until you come to the realization that you're not yet wise. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 18 This is why I was going to say no, but hardly any teenagers are wise because they have not come to the realization that they don't know anything or that they know very little. Right? They, you have to go through that, that time when you realize, boy, I didn't know as much as I thought I did. I wasn't quite so smart as I thought I was. And that's the first step to finding wisdom. When you realize that I don't really know as much as I thought I did, now you're on the path. 1 Corinthians 3.18 Let no man deceive himself if any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world. See, like the, the people of this world think that you're wise. right? When I talked about it's important what people think about you, I was talking about what godly people think about you. But when people in this world think that you're wise, better be careful, don't deceive yourself. Let him become a fool that he may be wise. If you seem to be wise in this world, you're not wise. You've got to become a fool. You've got to re renounce and reject all that worldly wisdom and get the wisdom that comes from God and His Word, and then you can start to become wise. Those who think they know a lot know nothing they ought to know, according to the Scripture anyway. 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 2. It says, if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. So if he thinks he knows anything, I guess you could say outside of God's revealed word, outside of the wisdom that God gives here, if he thinks he knows anything, he doesn't know anything like he ought to know. And a fool who thinks himself wise is self-deceived. Galatians 6 and verse 3. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. That's called self-deception. We did the, 
a whole series on deception back uh, was a couple of years ago now, I think. And I did a maybe a sermon or two on self-deception. You think you're something and you're nothing. Now, one of the first steps to become wise is to become humble, to have a low opinion of yourself, to view yourself lowly. And a good example of this was King Saul. Now, he, King Saul didn't end well. He started well. He didn't end well. And that's sad because you know, some people don't start well. I mean, think about there's two Sauls in the Bible, right? The first Saul started well and didn't end well. The second Saul started badly and ended well. Be wise in thy latter end, right? I'd much rather end well than start well and not end well. Uh, but Saul actually started well. 1 Samuel 15 and verse 17. 1 Samuel 15, 17. Now you don't really get this impression of Saul if you just think in the aggregate. If you think about the big picture of Saul, at least when I think of the big picture of Saul, I think about a, a, a terrible king, a, a, um, a paranoid, uh, crazy man, basically, is what he was, uh, envious, and, you know, very foolish. But he didn't start out that way. First uh, Samuel 15 and verse 17, And Samuel said, he's speaking to Saul, When thou wast little in thine own sight, Wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. It's really interesting there. He said, when thou wast little in thine own sight. Now, it's kind of, what makes this even more ironic is that Saul was not little in stature, physically. Mm -hmm. He was literally head and shoulders above the crowd. He was, he was a whole head taller than pretty much all the rest of the Israelites. But yet, when he was told that he was going to be king, he was little in his own sight. He viewed himself in a humble manner. He didn't think he was worthy of it. And I got a verse for you here. First uh, Samuel 9 and verse 21. I just had reason to, um, to look at this. Just the other day I was reading in Judges, which I'll get to in just a second. In Judges 6, in my morning Bible reading about Gideon, and I know it's just some things, it was just one of those days, some days you have good Bible reading and some days you don't, some days you just read and for an hour and you don't get anything out of it or your mind's elsewhere or whatever. Uh, that happens to all of us, preachers included. Uh, but some days you just have really good days and you read and you just, things are jumping off the page at you and you're learning all kinds of stuff. And the other day was one of those days for me. I love it when that happens. And anyway, I was reading there in Judges about Gideon, and I it just triggered a, a, me, a, a memory of this Saul being little in his own sight. And then when I went to that verse, I had a note written next to it that I'd totally forgotten about, which is the one that I'm going to show you right now in 1 Samuel 9, 21. And I'm like, oh, well, yeah, that's why he was little in his own sight. Like, I'd totally forgotten about that whole episode, and I forgot I'd even made a note about it, so obviously at some point I knew it and then, you know, forgotten. So anyway, I'm going to remind you of it. You might have forgotten about it too. First uh, Samuel 9 and verse 21, it says, and this is when, when Saul was approached by Samuel to be king. And Saul answered and said, I am, uh, am, uh, am not I a Benjamite? of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin. Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? So he's thinking, how in the world am I going to be captain of the Lord's people? How am I going to be the, the king of the nation of Israel when I'm from the smallest tribe, Benjamin's the smallest, you know, the, the, the least populous tribe, and I'm from the least of the families of the smallest tribe? I mean, talk about scraping the bottom of the barrel. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm from the other side of the railroad tracks. I mean, this is, I'm not, I have no business being king of Israel. Mm -hmm. So this is what Saul thought of himself. Mm -hmm. Even though he was a great, big, tall, presumably good-looking guy, uh, impressive physique, and yet he had a low opinion of himself, and, and a good low opinion of himself. That's really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Gideon. These are two 
great leader. Saul could have been a great leader. He, he would have been a great leader if it wasn't for his foolishness and envy of David. Uh, Gideon was another great leader, but Gideon was a very humble man. Uh, Judges 6 and verse 15. Judges 6 and verse 15. This is when, um, so the angel had come to Gideon when he was threshing wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites because they were, they were in such bondage and such desperate straits. The Midianites had destroyed all their food and, and so Gideon was just trying to provide for his family here and the angel comes to him and he calls him a mighty man of valor there in verse 12. And then the angel says um, to him there in, um, let's just start with verse 14. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. I'm from a poor family, and I am the least one, whatever that means. I don't know if he's youngest or whatever, but anyway, in his mind anyway, he's the least in his father's house. And so here the angel of the Lord, which is actually the second person of the Trinity, um, the Lord Jesus Christ pre-incarnate, speaking to Gideon here, and he tells him, you're going to deliver Israel. And Gideon's first thought is, I can't do that. I'm, I'm from uh, Manasseh. I'm from a poor family in Manasseh. And I'm the least of that poor family. I can't do this. He was little in his own sight. And the Lord was very merciful to him. So humble was he that he didn't even believe that he was able to do what God told him that he could do. Right? He had such a low opinion of himself that uh, he needed to have his faith improved because mm-hmm. you know, being humble is one thing, but being so, quote, humble that you don't even believe that you can do what God tells you to do, that's, I would say, too humble, but that's, it's, not, it's not really actually humi- humility. It's, it's not just, being yes, and you're not, you're just, it's a lack of faith is what it is. So getting back to, I kind of got sidetracked there a little bit. The man will not be truly wise until he humbles himself and doesn't think he's wise. A wise man doesn't tell others that he's wise. Those who have wisdom don't tell others they have wisdom. It's fools, not wise men, who think they are wise. Proverbs 26 and verse 12. Proverbs 26 and verse 12. Remember, one of my favorite Proverbs, Proverbs 27, I believe it is, to let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth, a stranger not thine own lips. There in verse 2. So you don't want to be telling people you're wise, because if you tell people you're wise, you are belying the fact that you're actually not. Uh, Proverbs 26 and verse 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit, there's more hope of a fool than of him. So if a man is truly wise, just show people you're wise. You don't have to tell people you're wise. You tell people you're wise, you're not wise. Show people you're wise. You know how you show people you're wise? By making good decisions. That's wisdom. You don't have to tell anybody you're wise. People will recognize it right away. Show them you're wise. We're told in Proverbs 3, 7 to be not wise in thine own eyes. Now, he doesn't say be not wise. <laughs> he says be not wise in thine own eyes. Right? Mm-hmm. Don't think yourself to be wise. Mm-hmm. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And remember, God pronounces a woe on those that are wise in their own sight in Isaiah 5 and verse 21. Now, the humble and the lowly have wisdom because they're wise enough to know themselves. Proverbs 14 and verse 8. Proverbs 14 and verse 8 says, The the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. See, the wise man understands his way. He understands himself. He knows himself. He's realistic with himself. He knows what he can do. He knows what he can't do. He knows what he really is. He knows what's in him. 
the folly of fools is deceit. See, fools deceive themselves and they think great things about themselves when they're not really, that's not really true. Whereas a prudent man, he understands his way. The good way, his good ways and his bad ways, he understands himself. Like John Wayne said, a man's just got to know his limitations. I think it was, was it a man's just got to know his limitations? I think it was John Wayne. Yeah, I, I think it was John Wayne. Or it might have been Clint Eastwood, Dirty Harry. I don't remember. I, I didn't see it. I've just heard other people say it, so I'm certainly no movie buff. Now, here's the thing, though. So a humble and a lowly person is wise enough to know himself, but he's not full of himself. See, there's a difference between knowing yourself and knowing yourself well and being full of yourself. See, wise men are not full of themselves. Fools are. Uh, Proverbs 18 and verse 2. Proverbs 18 and verse 2. It says, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. He doesn't want to learn anything. He doesn't want to be taught anything. He is only interested in himself. That his heart may discover itself. See, the fool is full of himself. The wise man knows himself. See, there's a really big difference between being full of yourself and knowing yourself. And you can easily figure out a person that's full of himself because he talks about himself all the time. If in a conversation, no curiosity, never asks any questions. Now, if somebody else is talking about something and they bring up something, it's just immediately change the subject to bring it back to myself, to talk about whatever's going on in my life or whatever I'm doing or whatever I think. That's a person that's full of himself. Um, always turns it around. The conversation somehow always turns around being about him. Wise and humble people are wise enough to understand their own fallen nature and limitations. So it's not just that they know all the good things about themselves. They know all the bad things about themselves, right? That, that's a, a humble and a wise person. And they recognize, that, I mean, they know exactly what's in them. They, like, but they can say what Paul said, that I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. That's a humble and a wise person. He knows what's in him. They also know that they are nothing without God and that they could know nothing apart from God's grace. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10. You always want to remember this. The Lord has blessed us, as I've mentioned recently, to have know, been blessed to know a lot of truth. But you always want to remember that if it weren't for the Lord's mercy and His grace to give you the capacity and the understanding to even be able to, to grasp that truth first of all, and then give you the opportunity to have come across some person who told you about it, some, some preacher or some other person, however you learned about it, to give you a Bible that you could read to learn about it, and the eyes of understanding to understand what you read, all those things. If God didn't give that to you, you wouldn't understand anything you understand now. right? So you got to remember that. You never want to get up on your high horse and think about how, what a, what, a, what a high spiritual plane I'm on because I know this truth because you wouldn't know anything if God didn't bless you to know anything. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know anything. What is that verse? What hast thou that thou didst not receive? receive. And if thou didst receive it, why dost thou boast? Mm -hmm. um, I it, it's in, it's in a, I think it's in one of Paul's epistles. Uh, it's in 1 Corinthians, I think, but I can't remember the exact place. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15 and verse 10 says, But by the grace of God, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Now see, Paul recognized both the grace of God and his own effort. Right? It's by the grace of God that I am what I am. I could never be what I am without the grace of God. But Paul also recognized, I labored really hard. I worked really hard. Um, so, you know, yes, I am what I am by the grace of God. You'd never have the understanding that you have. But if God gave you that understanding, but you never read the Bible and you never studied it, 
you're not going to know a whole lot. So God can give it to you and you'd never be what you are unless God gave you that ability. But then it's important to get in there and to read and to study and to learn and put in the hard work of learning the doctrine. So that's how God's grace and your effort work together to give you understanding, not to give you eternal life. See, most people think God's grace and your effort, you work together to get salvation. You don't, that's not how salvation works. But it is how understanding the scripture works, right? God's grace and hard work will give you understanding of the scripture. And wise and humble people know that without Christ, they could do nothing. John 15 and verse 5. I just read it, a very interesting commentary on this passage by none other than James Arminius. You know who James Arminius is? Arminius? The, you've heard the term Arminianism, right? Yeah. yeah, he's the guy that it's named after. Okay. okay, James Arminius. And I don't think he was quite as big of an Arminian as his followers are, <laughs> but uh, oh. which is kind of funny. Um, but, I mean, he, he was messed up, don't get me wrong, but I'm not sure he was as messed up as, as a lot of his modern day um, uh, adherents are. But anyway, he was talking about this verse. He was quoting it and, and, and um, expounding on it. I'll read you the verse first and I'll tell you roughly what he said. Um, John 15 and verse 5 says, I am, Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Now, Arminius said, it doesn't say that ye, ye, can do, ye cannot do some things, right? Or you can do some things, or, you know, whatever. He gave a bunch of other things. I don't remember what he said. But basically what he was saying is, Jesus said you can do nothing, and he meant it. You couldn't do anything without Jesus. You couldn't believe anything. You couldn't do a single good work for the right reason anyway. I mean, yeah, you could, you could clothe your kids and, and, and feed them or something because sinners do that. But you couldn't do any truly good thing for God. You couldn't believe any right thing. You couldn't take a stand for any righteous principle. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't please God. And Arminius realized that. What his idea was is that God gives this previent grace, this grace that goes before, which gives every man the ability to do good things to believe the gospel. So that was kind of his idea that he believed in total depravity, in the depravity of man anyway, but it was like God through his previent grace sort of undid all that for everybody and gave everybody enough of a boost that they could all believe if they just would do it, right? That's that's my my crude understanding of, of what Arminius was saying anyway. It's still being available to everybody. It's still available, yeah. Now, the ultimate example of a lowly man who was full of wisdom was the Lord Jesus Christ. And I got a couple of verses for you here. Um, just if you if you ever doubt that, well, you know, if I just if I really did humble myself and I really had a low opinion of myself and I really didn't promote my excuse me promote myself and try to impress other men, am I really ever going to get ahead? Am I really ever going to be wise in other men's sight? The Lord Jesus Christ is your answer. He was lowly, and yet he was wise, and he was certainly recognized as wise. Um, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29. Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Lowly, that's another word for humble. A meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Jesus was meek and lowly, but yet Jesus was wiser than Solomon. The wisest man that ever lived, until Jesus came along, Jesus was wiser than Solomon. Just turn over one chapter in uh, Matthew 12 and verse 42. Jesus said, The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. He's talking about himself. It's pretty obvious there. So here's a man who is meek and lowly, humble. Paul says, I beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. 
And it says there in, uh, in Philippians, I guess I, I will give you just one more verse, just to show you Christ's humility. Philippians chapter 2. In verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, that's humility, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. So there